uh, after a brief intro, he's, he'll be reading uh, excerpts from letters that he wrote from Cuba this past June uh, to monthly meeting elders, New England yearly meetings, Puente de Amigos committee co-clerks, uh, and other friends close to his ministry. In the spirit of this, uh, before we get started tonight, I'm going to read aloud a travel minute about Benigno from Northampton Friends Meeting uh, that also provides a sort of example, both in practice uh, and the letter itself, a key example of a Quaker epistle. And this is a travel minute for Benigno. Greetings from Northampton's friends in New England yearly meeting. It is very moving to send you our dear friend Benigno Sanchez Epler, who has traveled in the ministry under the care of our meeting for 25 years. We have faith that he will listen to how the spirit of God is moving among you and that he will wait until given a message that can speak to your condition. Benigno has grown in spirit from his work with other friends in the 90s, establishing sister relationships between meetings in New England and Cuba yearly meeting. Translating early Quaker texts into Spanish is a long established ministry he shares with Susan Fury. Workshops and teaching opportunities arise from that work. He has been a servant leader both to his monthly and yearly meeting. From 2015 to 2019, he served as clerk of Friends World Committee for Consultation, Section of the Americas, and at New England Yearly Meeting Sessions, and the Friends General Conference Gathering. He has offered Bible half hours. A hope that underlies Benigno's work is that Friends will find new life in the words of early Quakers, relearning and reclaiming the gospel vocabulary they used as our own shared language for our spiritual experience. A monthly meeting minute in April 2019, a, a monthly min meeting minute approved in 20, April 2019, affirms our continued support and oversight of Benigno's ministry in these terms. Quote, Northampton Friends Meeting unites with Benigno Sanchez Epler's call to travel in the ministry among friends. The functions and activities in which he has demonstrated gifts and discipline include translating, publishing, and teaching selections from the works of early friends, interpreting at international Quaker conferences, speaking publicly under the direction of, of the spirit, and vocal ministry in meeting for worship. We rejoice in this opportun opportunity to send you our love. We are confident that you will welcome Benigno and look forward to receiving news of you upon his return. Approved and minuted at Northampton Friends Meeting for Business, October 13th, 2019. With that, I'll invite us to settle into some silent and contemplative worship. Um, Benigno, please speak as you're led out of the silence.
Benigno, you're muted. So good evening, friends. I'm speaking to you from uh, Nonotuck land in Western Massachusetts. And, but I'm talking to you about uh, having been in Taino and Siboney and Guanajuato Bay land in, in the island of Cuba. For the last 30 years almost, I've gone to Cuba and I've visited my family a couple of times. But the other 10 times that I've gone back, I've gone to the heart of Cuba yearly meeting, which is an island within an island with a heart. Plants know about roots and we know about plants, roots. And um, what I want you to think about with this image in front of you is what those tendrils that this, that this Cultivar, it happens to be a small cucumber, but the whole family specializes in, in these tendrils that, that kind of reach out. And uh, the query is, what are they looking for? What are they knowing that they send themselves off up in the air looking for something that they're going to grab onto? What is sending them? How are they being guided? The first thing I want to do is something different from the tradition. If I were traveling, or as I am getting ready to deliver, I would have elders next to me. But in the modern time, sometimes it's difficult to get ourselves some elders. Yes, Karen, my wife and head co-minister, it's in the house. Um, but I want to recognize that they're members of my monthly meeting in the gathering, in the screen. And some have gone to Cuba. Some are in my, uh, some are members of my uh, ministry overhearers, I don't call them over here or overseers anymore. Um, and they will continue to hold me. There are many, many friends that are, um, that belong to the uh, wide community of Pendle Hill online. And they will help me to hold the gathering while my monthly meeting friends hold me. And that's what elders do. I'm going to go very fast with an introduction that tries to answer some of the things that I might have promised in the description of this lecture. Um, uh, but I'm not going to be, quote, teaching about traveling in the ministry. Um, I'm going to be giving you some fast backdrop so that you can sit back and uh, enter into the experience that I'm trying to provide, which is actually uh, letting you be part of the experience of being in Cuba. Because this time around, because I didn't carry my own elders with me and I was working with Cuban friends who were serving as such, um, I decided that the accountability in this case could use uh, modern technology, namely the availability of, of email, for me to write as often as I could um, back to my overhearers and to the uh, co-clerks of the Puente de Amigos Committee of New England Yearly Meeting, which has under its care the relationship, the yearly meetings, this, the yearly meeting sister relationship between Cuba Yearly Meeting and New England Yearly Meeting. So, Hopefully, these are Quaker letters. Um, they came out day by day. The discipline or the opportunity to sit and not just report, but feel again what was going on and try and get 
strength to do it was actually very enriching and it got me very close to the source of all this work. So I'm going to go through a whirlwind of chronology um, just to let you know where I've been. So in 1981, in January, I walk into my first Quaker meeting in Jesus Lane, Cambridge, England. And between 83 and 88, I'm a regular attendant, moving to become a member of Homewood Friends in Baltimore. And the one thing I want to highlight is that throughout these years, I worked in committees, I felt great affinity for Friends Wade, but I had no sense of ministry, no sense of calling. And I think that's interesting. And that was okay. It's okay to have to be a friend and to um and to operate um in that uh greenhouse of the spirit. Nineteen ninety one in August. New England Yearly Meeting could not find an interpreter for the keynote message of Cuban pastor Heredio Santos. Somebody suggested I could do it. And I had never done such a thing. In fact, I did not know what the job entailed, but not a single doubt entered my mind. That's just amazing. I was asked to do something I've never done, and I did not have a single doubt that I could just say yes. But I also know that I was not the one who did it. And in so far as I performed a service that called on to a gift that I didn't know I had or I had, that makes me think that it was both mine and not mine. And that was the first sign that something was going on in my life, um, that I was either already equipped or being equipped to do things in the life of the spirit. Between 1992 and 1996, the sister yearly meeting relationship between Cuban and New England friends takes off. And there are other things happening simultaneously when this is happening at the yearly meeting level. Um, the spirit uses Susan Furry, who's in another New England meeting, way in the east in Massachusetts, uh, use, uses Susan Furry's calling to translate Quaker text to rope me into that work. She would threaten me. She would say, if you don't edit what I've just translated, I'm going to embroider it and send it to Cuba, and I'm going to embarrass you uh, with my mistakes. Another thing that was happening exactly around these years is Northampton Friends was becoming a monthly meeting. And these processes together spark and sustain the growth of concerns into ministry. By the mid 90s, there's a great overlap between the Friends in Northampton creating the monthly meeting and my first clearness committee to travel in the ministry to Cuba. In the late 90s, many trips to Cuba, including a traveling, a traveling meeting, forget traveling ministers, a traveling meeting of 18 weighty elders and young friends together get organized and happens. And at the same time, many visits of Cuban friends to New England yearly meeting are organized and take place. In the 2000s, Cuban friends start convening study workshops, which soon become the Cuban Quaker Peace Institute under the spirit-led direction of Ramon Gonzalez Longoria. Susan and Benigno go and teach Fox and Naylor and Barclay's Apology and Thomas Kelly and early Quaker women's writing and Quaker process and John Woolman's journal and Samuel Bonas and Bolding Sonnets. And not because we are scholars of these things, but just because we've translated them into Spanish and because we can stage, we can invite people to read and to talk and to test what they're reading 
with their own experience and the life of the spirit. Other teachers work with Quaker history and holiness and AVP trainings and mediation and Cuban French church history and Hebrew and Midrash and all so many things that I, that I haven't fit in this, uh, in this list. As soon as a Cuban friend feels they can teach anything among these new materials or this old material that they're re-experiencing, they take over the reading materials and adapt them to their needs. By the early 2010s, there is a thawing um, in the relationship between the governments of the US and Cuba, and many hopes spark up and all those hopes are dashed in 2016. I am not called. My travel minute doesn't say that I have to talk about this. So I move on. After 2016, Cuban friends are no longer granted visitors visas to travel to New England. And while visitors visas are not granted, the difficulties in Cuba and the U.S. Cuban Adjustment Act of 1966, this is a Johnson administration uh, legislation, makes it easier for Cubans to stay in the United States, however they can manage to get there, and be received as refugees with a path to residency and citizenship. They ended up calling this the Cuban exception, but it is based on the Cuban Adjustment Act of 1966. Spain's immigration policy also grants European entry to the de descendants of uh, Spanish citizens. And these two outlets make it possible for many young people, including recently trained Quaker pastors and ministers to leave Cuba in large numbers. And this pattern greatly intensified after the pandemic. So traveling in the ministry to Ireland or Rwanda, for me, are examples of acute and passing leadings, often blessed extensions of another Quaker errand. I feel call of the spirit to engage, but the concerns to travel there come with a healthy expiration date. It holds me for as long as it does, but it does not tie me up. It does not tie me up. It leads me free to take further direction from the life of the spirit. Translating early Quaker texts is, on the other hand, a long longitudinal concern. Insofar as it is incurable, it is chronic, and therefore more than a burning new or renewed leading. When life is orderly and way opens to a manageable living norm, Susan and I translate for three to as many as 10 hours every week. Traveling in the ministry to Cuba usually happens when the concern to accompany them heats up or when they need me to teach something from what Susan and I have translated. The concern is not so chronic but the availability lingers and I'm, I'm easy and I'm easy. Sometimes I say, but I'm easy with not living there with them and then showing up fully when I hear myself call and sent. So this time, a lot of things flow together as way open to go to Cuba. There are four areas of things that happened. And the first one was that I was smarting from their pain, their pain about COVID, the pain about economic and restructuring and disorganization, their, their drain of pastors and other leaders. Leaders, the lead leaders still in Cuba, keeping burnout at bay. And I had not been there since 2018. 
And I wanted to make myself available for whatever the spirit had in store for us. The second area of interest here is that Susan and I had translated Brian Drayton's On Living with a Concern for Gospel Ministry. FGC Books and FWCC Americas found a copy editor and the process of revision proved exhausting. And we had to remember for whom and by whom we worked. And Brian's reminders that friends' work had been spread out among ministers, elders, and supervisors, and as deacons in Greek, um, and our certainty that we are a church without laity, we are a church without laity, we are a church without laity, started to make me think that Cuban pastors were doing the three jobs simultaneously and without much help. Then there was a third thing flowing in here. I cleared with my overhearers, my Northampton Friends Committee for uh, Ministry Support, a leading to spend some time at Pendle Hill reading the Bible and rewriting from my notes on Exodus. Cuban friends and their struggles came up daily in daily worship in the barn. I seldom deliver vocal ministry about it, but sitting in the barn and thinking about the troubles of Cuban friends was one of those sort of monastic repetitions that happen in places like Pendle Hill and for Quakers only in places like Pendle Hill. Now Moses came through as a hard worker who was doing all the jobs until his father-in-law eldered him into delegating. It's really amazing to have a father-in-law intervene and tell you, hey, kid, you're doing it wrong. Delegate. And into growing the gifts God seated among the people. The Pendle Hill months filled a reservoir of love and attention that wanted to spill out onto ascending. The more I think about Pendle Hill and traveling in the ministry, the more I want to say that one of the things your monthly meeting could do when it sends you or when it wants to support you is actually give you uh, 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 give you a real grounding in, uh, in, in, in devotional and concentrated uh, discernment and a retreat at Pendle Hill, however short, however long you want it, before you to get on the road would actually be quite a thing to regularize among the Society of Friends um, as we move forward. My monthly meeting overhearers wonder why I was so overwrought. Because I was. And worried that I would buckle under the frustration of not being able to fix all the Cuban problems. And there's a loving thing that takes over our worries where we want to be the ones who fix all the Cuban problems. And then one day, the beats, the bees, the three hives on the concrete slab between Furbank and Owen's garden sorted me out. And this is what happened. I'm very allergic to bees and my wife is very, very, interested in me not having anything to do with bees and she didn't want me to walk in there between the, the bees and fur bank but i did and one day i was half thinking about cuba and half thinking about the bees and all of a sudden it became clear that if i didn't go out to the fields to cut flowers to bring a bunch of flowers over to the hives to feed the bees, the bees weren't going to be doing anything, anything bad to me. The bees were going to be able to find their own flowers wherever their flowers were. And I didn't have to be the one to cut flowers and bring it to the bees.
that was a little weird. But I went ahead and told my uh, ministry oversight committee. And somehow, when I told them that story about the freedom from having to bring flowers to the bees, I felt I was ready to go to Cuba. Now I need you to hold me in the light. We're going to read, I'm going to read fragments from the letters that I wrote in Cuba. And I want you to remember that these are at some level letters that report on who's my elder for the stretch and what's happening and what's uh, difficult and what's blessed. And um it is a very, sometimes a very intimate uh, view of what's going on. You're not getting everything. There's plenty of pastoral information in these letters that are not going to be read. Um, and so I would like you to uh, take on some position. Are you a traveling minister preparing to go? Are you a member of a monthly meeting that needs to figure out how to support ministry as it rises in the monthly meeting? Are you leadership in a yearly meeting that wants to um, foster the ways that monthly meetings have to pay attention to the development, to the rising, to the good use, to the maintenance of the gifts that rise in our, in our midst. So you will hear these fragments as you will. And I am just knowing that this is a, it's, a, it's an intervention that um, I'm, I have some trepidations about, um, but here it goes. Anna will tell me at some point that I have um, uh, time for just one more fragment, and then I will go to the one that I have chosen to close the reading with. But I will start from the beginning in the fragments. Hold me in the silence and in the light as I locate, uh, as I put the file up. From Benigno in Olguin, Puente Ministry, 2023-05-31, Wednesday, day one. Dear friend, I'm in Olguin. All the small and medium hurdles and the inevitable narrows have been sorted. All of it, as cumbersome as it is, feels normal and the sense of gratitude is immense. Praise and thanks to whom we belong. And thanks to all of you who keep, who help God make the miracles happen. A string of miracles makes a living norm wherever the faithful use their guts to make heartstrings. The lunch table was splendid. I think Cuban friends do without for two weeks or more to come up with a spread like that. No amount of complaining about unnecessary splendor will ever, will ever stop them from hosting as they wish. When I got elderish, they elder me back, clearly warning me that I should not spoil their joy of hospitality with my scruples. 
I will sleep in the upper rooms at the Olguin downtown church. In the bunk dorm with great bathroom facilities for the next four nights. I won't write down now what they're planning to do with me. I prefer to report on all that when it happens. As of this writing, the New England Yearly Meeting Puente Committee cash gift is already in their capable hands. We would just spend it. They will do miracles. Oh six, oh one, Thursday, day two. During the last night's visit to the small Vistalegre Chapel, a proper monthly meeting, Pastor Lillanis gathered with five other friends for a Bible study and conversatorio. Maria Yi, the pastor of Olguin Central Church and one of my elders for this stretch, had not let me walk the 10 to 12 blocks. For 30 years, nobody has ever bothered to escort me in all game until now. Only in gang-run San Salvador have I been equally forewarned and provided with protective eldering services. That bad? I asked. Yes, more than once said. During the conversation, two young men of about 20 with a firm and tender presence not only spoke well and feelingly, but they also carried that glow of young friends glad to be with each other in church. The grown-ups were visibly proud of their company. God doesn't speak in voices in my head, but I do hear things quite distinctly, even if inaudibly. My guide let me know it's okay to feel envious for having such young people in the gathering. Go ahead and tell them about your envy. It was clear that all those present felt encouraged by the visitor going out on a limb and confessing that I was envious of their church for having two young men walking in in the pouring rain to attend a prayer meeting and to be so edifying themselves during a weeknight discussion. Pastor Lianis couldn't help her own wholesome spiritual mother glow. The two young men were glad to take me back to the church dorm downtown. This morning's breakfast was ready for me when I came down at 7.30. Café Solo and Café Con Leche both. And a whole wheat bread bun that Cubans sneer at. One of the few things still distributed and heavily subsidized by the government. I have my fun teasing them about how much more we prefer the bit of fiber in the whole wheat instead of the expensive white bimbo bread from the dollar store. Dayenu. But then Pastor Maria Yi left me speechless. A ripe banana, okay, not such a big deal, but three pickled pigeon eggs, unheard of, delicious, pure doting. All I could do was to let me to let them see more of my Cuban delight in their generosity and less of my dour Yankee displeasure at their reckless extravagance. Oh six, oh one, still Thursday, still day two, but late at night. Dear friends, Remember, this is to my elders and to friends very close to the work and to my family. Dear friends, and now to you. Dear friends, the morning was busy. I left the church with my two elders for Olguin. Lianette came out equipped with her shopping bags and headed for making the line for cooking oil. Hers is some ministry. 
making the line for about a dozen families for whatever shows up at uh, at uh, one of the ever dwindling government of, of the ever dwindling government goods. Here, I should leave a large space to come back and write later when I can do honor to the complications of her life and the number of gifts she can deploy in a day of life and a week of church work. I met her years ago when she was very sharp, young sound tech for the church in Olguin. Back then, she had already started to shine as Maria Yi's assistant. But now, she supports so many people and so many processes in the church that she emerged in my mind as the best example of the traditional Quaker supervisor. Let's use the term because we cannot use overseer any longer. And because some of us may choke if we use the appropriate biblical Greek term of deacon. I thought I was going to have trouble explaining the traditional Quaker function of being in charge of deploying the meeting's resources to respond to the need of members and attenders. But here was a living example I could point to, and the explanation would be done. That the pastor had to figure out a way of avoiding burnout by identifying and deploying the gifts of friends who may rise to fulfill the function of deacon was one of the things I wanted to talk about. And right in front of me, Maria and Lianette were yoked in their service and their love for one another and for the members and attenders of the Friends Church. Lianette found a friend that could make an old phone Maria found a hotspot for my Wi-Fi needs. He tinkered with it, and before I knew it, I had something I could use to tether my computer and phone to Cuban cell towers to communicate with the world, mostly to write to my elders and my family back in New England. Maria and Lianette were doing their joint eldership to my ministry and providing in Cuba the examples I needed to illustrate 17th and 18th century Quaker structures. I told them as soon as I noticed that what they were doing for me and with me was the best example of the yoking of minister and elder. And I did not have to struggle to use 17th, 19th century examples, not even stories from New England. They were doing the work exactly as the tradition had done it, but they were doing it within the Cuban condition. They were glad to have another name for their working relation. Maria and I left Lianette in the cooking oil line and went on to ends. A friend known to me from our previous Puente crossings, both me visiting Cuba and her visiting New England. The Puente connection may be a little more daring than I have, that I may have been with someone else, her pastor, my elder, had spoken of her need for firm shaking out of bed. We went to visit a friend in a seriously depressed state that almost works like a full allegory of the island itself. One of her sons works abroad. Her house is pristine, remarkably well equipped. A very able friend of the family is delighted to have been hired to move in with her to manage the house and take care of her. Her son visits when he can and then returns to work far away. And she sinks into bed with no desire to do any of the things she used to do. A pillar of the community crumbling with combination of feeling guilty for her relative affluence in the midst of all the surrounding misery and feeling abandoned by the son who provides amply for her, but with repeated long absences and not enough returnings. Maria had every intention to deploy the visitor in her pastoral rounds. I had told her that in the six days before the upcoming pastors and ministers retreat, that would happen in day seven to day 10, I needed to be soaking, baptizing myself in their condition. And she took me to places, dragged me along to do things where I could soak indeed. When I wonder out loud in her company about the mirror image of faithful members' depression, 
and the national feeling of general abandonment. She stopped in the middle of the street to catch her breath and to preach a very complicated wordless message with the smile of a great chronic sadness both owned and worked through. When we left ends, Maria and I just walked around the corner and into the central cemetery. I had asked to be taken to the cemetery where friends I knew had been buried. Many of the death were COVID related, a few were not. We were blessed with a very quiet opportunity at her family's burial site. Oh six, oh two, Friday, day three. Eleven women showed up to their midweek worship meeting at Old Dean's Friends Church. One of them spoke about the way, the truth, and the life. A much appreciated and dutifully prepared message showing the love and the blow of the spirit in the dedication to the task. You have to be moved of the spirit to sit down and write a message for your sisters in the middle of the daily rush and drama in the life of a Cuban hospital nurse. Among the very lively chatter before settling, we were favored with a blast of laughter when one of them mentioned the WhatsApp, the WhatsApp snafu of one sister asking the group for help because a hospitalized elder church member needed a brujula, a compass. I heard the word brujula and the laughter and some of the embarrassment of being so uh, loud and raucous on the brink of worship. The raucous got tamped down and remained unexplained for, 20 minute, for the 20 minutes that Sylvia commented on the passage and for the discussion that followed and for the announcements of the women's activity for the coming week. When they turned to me, the guest, with some solemnity on the part of the women who had not met me and with tender welcoming smile in the face of those who had worked with me before, which included Maria and Lianet, my elders. There's the light in that mischief, which I feel as holy mischief. What rose was strong and very Cuban. I knew it would take us back to the raucous, I checked myself for the brief silence allowed, uh, allowed to someone invited to speak in the Cuban Friends Church. I heard my guy saying with a big smile, sueltalo, or let it fly, or free it up. That will shatter the solemnity. Then I asked, so what happened to the brujula? What happened to the compass? The laughs exploded again, this time with the sputtering of those who wanted to tell and the shushing of those who felt obligated to return to some semblance of order. Why would a bedridden elderly friend need a compass? One of the four nurses in the group of 11, that's amazing, four nurses in the group of 11 women, um, was able to explain that what, was that what was needed was a branula, an intravenous device with needle and reusable medication port. But the sister had written brujula. It took nurses to sort out the confusion and the whole church to enjoy the tango. I was baptized in the simultaneous joy of joy and pain, simultaneous joy and pain of knowing that hospitals lack such basic equipment and that one sick person might need it and not have it available and knowing at the same time that a group of women 
from a friend's church would make it their personal corporate business to communicate as widely as they could to try to find something that precious and that specific. I probably looked right to proceed and the silence that settled, so nourishing, served up by the spirit like that between so deep a laughter and such a fresh, brief waiting, that felt full and shared and unrushed, even if short. The inward compass, directing, lighting, opening the way and pointing to the truth and the life made me feel the work of a made me feel the work of a good needle in the heart steady and easy while we keep headed towards its price and it will shave and tear and cut as we deviate and will return to ease as we reorient the confusion between a compass and an intravenous device felt so revealing. We sank deep, talking about a Quaker inner compass and about the, about the guide in our blood. We ran a little late. The men were gathering in another room. Eight showed up. The transition was short. Three of the women stayed with the men. Initially, the brother who had agreed to dirigir, to direct the men's meeting, had not arrived, and by the time he did, others had started talking. He did come prepared with two topics that he would ask the hermanos to choose from. One, John 3.16. And, or, or two, the upsurge of violence and all kinds of mayhem in Cuba with plenty of nostalgia for the overall political restrictiveness, which at least in the old days, let you walk the streets in relative safety. He then handed the meeting over to me. I acknowledge that what I needed most was to hear about their condition and that the two themes struck me quite related, struck me as quite related because God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone that believes in him not be lost, but have eternal life. I only said what rose, which was um, really open-ended. And I, I said that the friend had pitched his topics as two different things, but if we acknowledge that God the Father did his giving by putting his son through an explicitly violent death by crucifixion, then we were talking about violence in both tacks. And that I wanted to hear how thinking about those two things together would let them speak to each other about their, about their condition. I also said we would start by sharing one joy and one sorrow each. These are the tricks that traveling ministries, for, for traveling ministers firm up while staying put in the barn at Pendle Hill. Joys and sorrows. I said I felt called to insist that the joys would be offered first and then the sorrow. Even if the crucifixion came first and the resurrection afterwards. What we experience in resurrections gives us strength to deal with what we suffer in crucifixions. One felt the joy of feeling safe and cared for in the church stronger because the reality of the terror out there felt more palpable. Another felt grateful both for what he had and for an increased capacity to do with less. But he confessed that he felt poisoned by the rage that possessed him when he faced the futility in any attempt to help all who need so much. Another felt a great joy in the love and resilience of the family 
and the great pain in the daily departures that were decimating other families and inevitably threatening his own. Another was grateful for an increased urgency he felt to preach the gospel to those with hearts so empty and so hardened that they could only resort to violence. Here there was a reminder that God already dwell in the hardened heart as much as in the empty one. Another follow saying that he rather talk about hope more than a hope more than the joy. And said that learning more about the evil in the heart that leads to violence pushed him to look more honestly into his own heart with the certainty that finding the evil, the evil in it that needed to be perched would get him closer to the hope of salvation. Another was glad to feel he could help something and devastated by the failure of giving something to someone he found scavenging in a restaurant trash who sneered at him because the offered 20 pesos would not buy anything. Beyond that, the talk of heart and hearts and need for repentance in the perpetrators of violence led to the hope that they might hear the loving Christ knocking at the door. Then it got dark again, as we remember the Quaker insight that God may do his knocking from within, from within the heart in which he lives in prison or oppressed. Not a single joy or hope came cleanly untangled from some pain or sorrow. But there was palpable strength and some relief in filling, filling the room with the mix. I reminded them of the example of the Psalms where the joys and the sorrows break quite tightly. But closer to home, I was able to work with them in an exercise giving first to the few gathered on Wednesday night at Vista Alegre. I did not intend to postpone the discussion of that for an effect. Notice that the affects were stronger on Thursday evening and that the preparation to explore the physicality of the bodily truth came in a less extreme experience. Back in Vista Alegre, with only five friends and the pastor, we had talked enough about their condition, even without framing them through the joys and sorrows. Back in Vista Alegre, it was given to the pastor to remark how alentador, encouraging. It was to desahogarnos juntos, to unburden ourselves together. The bilingual traffic here is very telling and completes a Quaker insight that's not easily available in either language alone. Encouragement, it's a matter of the heart. El core. And putting something in it that helps. Unburdening has to do with putting down oppressive weights. All that is part of the process at hand. Then in Spanish, alentar and dar aliento has everything to do with giving breath. Like the God of creation puts breath into inanimate us. And desahogarnos, desahogarnos is an undrowning. Here I was listening to Cuban friends very naturally and idiomatically talking about the corporate undrowning possible when baptizing each other in our joys and sorrows as members soaked together in the intimacy of the body of Christ. Benigno, we have time for, for one more fragment. Back in Vista Alegre, with only five friends and the pastor. That, I read that, sorry. I was shocked 
by the certainty that made me say in Vista Alegre that I wanted to work with some breathing truths that hit me when I heard the pastor say, que alentador es desahogarnos juntos. I noticed and I said that it was impossible to let out a sigh without first taking a lung full of breath. The Spanish word suspiro, if we can understand undertow, we should be able to understand under breath. I stood up in our little circle and I said, try it. And I am wondering whether you can try it too. Um, as I tried with them to sigh without taking a full breath first, I felt a deeper drowning. As I tried with them to sigh without taking a full breath first, I felt a deeper drowning. And then a deeper hunger for air opened my being and I took it by the mouthful of bocanadas. All of us in the room gulped in that large chunk of God abundance air. And without liturgy, we felt communion. And when we let it out, all our suspiros were one. And I will go way over and read to you a letter written after the pastor's retreat. I'm not reading anything from the pastor's retreat because there were some very tender and uh, complicated things happening there. Six. 06, 11, Sunday, day 12. Returning from Banes on Friday, the church van went over a brand new and deep pothole, courtesy of the rains. The metal rim of the wheels bit into the tire. The damage to the tire is irreparable. This is not just a flat. In the north, we may have thrown out that tire a long time ago. And here, the damage is such that they cannot use it as a tire. God knows what abundance or alternative use Cubans will make of the materials, which they don't have any intention of throwing away just like that. Ironically, the metal rim would also be retired from service and sent to the dump in the United States. Here, they just have to heat it and hammer it and file it down until that dent is gone and the rim can roll round again. I keep thanking God for always making me carry the eldering edge of Susan Furry, my translation partner, in my ear. So she can articulate the most terrifying admonitions for the moment. This time I can hear her saying, no matter how you slice it, that flat tire and that bending of the rim, it's all your fault. They wouldn't have gone to Banis if they didn't want to take you. There's more, a kind of spillage of the eldering that moves into suggestions about cashing in part of my pension funds to buy them a new van and insurance and a good toolbox and the proper salary for the driver so he doesn't have to stop every time he sees produce on the road to buy a little so he, so he can sell a little. Often the Lord himself gives me something else to pay attention to and breaks the spiraling uselessness. And for a time like this, when I'm alone and beset by ruminations and detailed ideations that could, if unchecked, sink me into a distraction of the irreparable kind, I take out the travel minute. I take out the travel minute and review the boundaries of the errand and wave it around a bit, like a wave offering. Then I can feel the train of rumination and the interlinked worry and helplessness decouple. And with the helplessness defang, the worry becomes again a concern, an interés espiritual. A saving train that hitches sorrow to a vivid revelation of the gifts given to Cuban friends 
for a time like this in a place like theirs. And the love in me, capital love in me, bursts out and says it. And they have to hear me saying from the deep of my love for them that I that what I see in every maneuver, in every tactic, in every desperate act of survivalism, in every moment of upholding integrity and keeping the so-called inevitable temptations of the jungle at bay, they have to hear that what pulls them through as often as they do, as often as they do it for love, is the efficacy and presence of the capital gift in them. The gift in them. I learned from translating Samuel Bonus that the gift in us, capital G, hyphen in, hyphen us, the gift in us names God as fully as light, seed, or love. I have thought that before in Cuba and in more than one location, but in those locations, I thought it like an interesting thing one Quaker figured out. Every time I thought it before, I knew, I knew a few or many would feel it in their lives, add it to the experience and link it to the many ways God works. But this time is a little different because the lesson rose from our experiments and awakening to the sense that the meeting the Friends Church was responsible as a community for the recognition, the growth, and the proper use of the gift in everyone. In a church without laity. And in the world in which there is that of the gift in everyone. In just one week and a few days, it has become so easy to feel and weigh and say truths like that. I have been doing and saying parts of that message before, but now it comes out easier, I think, because the need in Cuba has turned my love for them into something that clamors for the gift in me to call out the gift in them. I think because the need in Cuba has turned my love for them into something that clamors for the gift in me to call out the gift in them. Now I can use a few hyphens and uppercase markings to name something and to see what happens to me. Still here, but preparing to go back home. In my experience traveling in the ministry, the capital need in them, the hyphen capital need hyphen in hyphen them, the need in them, another name and office of our inward God Christ spirit has become so visible, so palpable, so effective at work inside the broken heart and the empty heart and the hardened heart. This is the God of those remarkable theologies where God is alive, suffering with us. In the flood, in the hunger, in the social and economic helplessness, that is the God most manifest. And this is not the external God that doles out opiates to anesthetize the people or to sink them into irreversible addictions. When the need in them breaks through, and speak, speaks to the love in us. When the need in them breaks through and speaks to the love in us, where will the conversation take us? Will we then notice? Will we then notice what kind of seed is being planted in what kind of furrow? Nina, thank you so much for all of that. 
I'll allow that to, to season with folks for a second and we'll move into a QA. and uh, a reminder that you can put your questions from Indigno to, to me in, in a chat message uh, and, I, and I will ask them out loud, um, but I'd, I'd invite us all to take a second. While we're waiting for some questions, some more questions to come in, um, I know that you touched on this quite a lot during tonight, over the course of this evening. Um, often we start by asking what, what spiritually sort of sustains or nourishes you in your work. Um, and I'm wondering if there's anything else specifically to that question that you'd like to, that you'd like to share or, or speak on. There's at least two two answers to that that come to mind right away. One is that the work itself sustains the work. Um, there's something about there's something about moving under guidance and moving where love is the first motion that puts the fuel in the mo it puts the fuel in the doing. And so, yes, it's tiring. Yes, you have to prepare. Yes, you have to, you know, eat proteins. I mean, what, however you want to put it in physical terms. But there's something about the work being the source of the fuel. And it's not surprising because if you are doing your guides, guidance, your guide is working with you. There's nothing that you do that isn't done by that force that wants to work through you. And so the problems come when you insist in doing something by your own guts or in your own stubbornness or in your own... Uh, if If the work is truly the Lord's, that has his budget, that has his uh, energy and its spiritual budget, even unto death. And then more practically, actually, it's the reality of the fueling station which is the monthly meeting in our in our uh in our in, in, in our life in our spiritual life um and so you don't know you don't know where the hose is or so you've lost track of um how you consent to 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 have that of god in you really be in you or that of God in you, that of God in you is in you, but you don't let it work in you. And so you might need to go to a fueling station and that let let your monthly meeting be that. And then friends in your monthly meeting will take up that business of recognizing your gift, the ones that aren't working or the ones that um, are emerging or the ones that have to be laid down actually so that you can work with new ones where you will have your own fuel and all of that you can't do by yourself particularly if you come in and out of uh, lows which is part of spiritual life it's part of the, the normality of spiritual life you go up and down no? uh, and so when you lean on the monthly meeting to give that to you or fellow ministers uh, or 
elders or good overseers that actually I mean I, I said overseers I'm sorry good good uh, good deacons in the church that actually um put put the 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 resources of the monthly meeting to address your needs um then you get then you get the fueling again uh so I would put it in those two areas there's no graduate degree that you need to go and get there's no particular new job that you need to go and get you need to spruce up on how God loves you and how that love wants to work through you and you need to lean on the love of your dear brothers and sisters at the monthly meeting and that will push you through um and if you are far from your monthly meeting you may want to go and read Brian Brian Drayton's book, this book that because we translated and because we prepare and because we could take to Cuba uh, for them to sort out, you know, unbind and reshuffle uh, in their own terms. Uh, you may actually, you may actually do a lot of refueling by finding the people in your circles that want to read that book with you together. And it's not a manual but it has a lot of experiences of the joys and the sorrows of, of um, gospel ministry. And you can start off a conversation that will give you fuel. Thank you. Uh, I'll find the link to that book uh, and put it in the chat later, but. Something that I am curious about as someone who loves nothing more than to write and receive letters is about what about, or in hearing all of these pieces of your letters, I'm wondering what letter writing allows for maybe spiritually, especially as someone who's traveling in ministry, what openings it gives um, as opposed to journaling or writing an essay or an article or like a, a creative report or, or like a personal, personal nonfiction piece. What about, even if those are not to be published or read by others or if they are what about writing a letter and re maybe receiving a letter too what openings does that allow for you in your role as as being a traveler traveling minister um uh, i'm you know it's interesting because i i teach writing and uh in conventional attempts to get people going you always tell them you know what you want to say, but it will help you to figure out who you want to say it to. And so you're developing a sense of audience, even when there is not an addressee, um, the writer is invited to think about, well, who's your audience? When you're writing a letter, that's figured out. Because you say, dear so-and-so, and so that's your audience. Um, in many ways, the motive for searching and for laying down either the story or the implications or the discoveries um, also get the, again, the fuel that what you're narrating, it's part of what you want to tell somebody that you really want to communicate with. Um, uh, I don't know if people remember, but if you ever wrote love letters, um, there is there there is a the, the the problem there is when to stop writing. The the energy is it's uh, you know the energy is is inexhaustible. Uh, if you write to a spiritual companion, if you write to someone who is holding you in your work, um, as my my overhearers hold me in my work on behalf of the monthly meeting as the month as the monthly meeting holds me in my work um 
then you have an you have a need to 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 link up with them to actually give them a taste of the experience a taste of the discoveries and it's a, it, it's a desire just like anything else um uh when i when the, this course that i'm putting together i do teach letter writers uh in uh in, in, in an english department course um when i decided to try it out uh, to go and teach it in pendle hill um i immediately added um the second person psalms and so there all of those you psalms all of those you psalms i'm going to ask the people who come to this course to actually read and to imagine that if you write a you psalm or you write a you poem you're actually writing a letter which means that if you know how to pray and you have the you of the the you who's receiving the prayer very clearly defined you actually have a, 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 a you know and an i am thou relationship with that recipient of the prayer um praying has that sense of epistolarity it's a message you want to tell who you're praying to um and so psalms are not letters prayers are not letters but the you psalms and the prayer where you say dear lord dear dear god dear spirit hear me um they have um they have actually uh, similarity with the letter as they strive to bridge the distance um when we feel down when we feel unaccompanied by god if we reach out for an epistolary outlet you are trying to be present with that god that's not there and there's something when you know when you say dear god hear me out um it it kind of tells that you're not quite you're not quite believing that god is within you or that you have to invoke it you have to make it happen you know and i think epistolarity has that possibility uh, when paul writes letters he writes it to people and when they get that letter they feel immediately related to paul these are small communities these are uh, people who need to be regarded as whole, you know family um and so the letters get letters do that work um and i didn't have my elders with me um and i needed to tell them they asked me explicitly make sure you tell us who's taking care of you they didn't say because you can get out of hand you know um but it's a good thing to imply i can get out of hand okay um <laughs> yeah and so knowing that i had to sit and testify to a you plural but very close to me um help me to retain some the, the accountability uh so i think that's part of what happened i don't know what comes through to the ear for somebody who's who's listening at some point i told you you have to listen to these letters as if i wrote them to you you know um and i'm i, I wonder whether that happened to some of you maybe i'm asking you questions <laughs> yes. I'm looking at the time and I know that we have to close out for tonight. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much for taking this time and for sharing all that you shared um, and like in the vulnerability that that, that requires. Um, feeling super grateful to, to have been a part of and witnessed your time at Pendle Hill um, and excited to also welcome you back as a spring term faculty member. Um, and thank you all for, for joining us on Zoom. This lecture is recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, and before we close out the night, um, I wanna again highlight the 2024 spring term, uh, which Benigno will be a faculty member. Uh, on campus March 1st through May 10th. The spring term is Pendle Hill's 10-week residential student program. Um, 
welcoming people of all faith backgrounds uh, to live at Pendle Hill in a rhythm of worship, work, and study around our core educational themes of faith and practice, prophetic witness, and nurturing creativity. Um, so Benigna will, will be joining us as faculty along with Dwight Dunstan, Valerie Brown, uh, Ricardo Levins Morales, uh, and, and more. I'm gonna put the link in the chat so you can read more about that on our webpage. And we'll also be hosting uh, info sessions in both the, in both October and November. What I mentioned also earlier this, thank you, Francisco. Um, and I mentioned earlier in the night that we, we're gonna be, we are hosting an online uh, resident reunion uh, on September 24th. So if you were a friend in residence, a student, uh, a scholar, a faculty member, or a staff member at Pendle Hill, um, from last year or from 40 years ago, we'd love for you to join us on Zoom for this online reunion celebrating Pendle Hill's 93rd uh, anniversary um, and to get to reconnect um, and share in worship with folks in that way. The last two things I'll highlight is we don't have a first Monday lecture in our traditional sense next month, September, we'll be having our Stephen G. Carey Memorial Lecture with Bridget Moi, uh, mm -hmm. General Secretary of FCNL. Um, feel free to register for free online. And we also have a really limited number of on-campus uh, spots. So you can come and join us uh, in the barn on campus and Bridget will be there as well. And I feel excited about an on-campus opportunity to listen to, to listen to someone share a message. And the lastest, lastest thing is if you haven't already, um, check out our podcast, The Seed Conversations for Radical Hope. We're in the process of releasing season three. Um, and we have a new episode coming out tomorrow. So subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and let me put those links in there. And as always, you can find uh, a full list of upcoming programs on our webpage. Financial assistance is available for the majority of our on-campus programming. Um, and you can find details about that on each event page as well. With that, I know it's 9.03, but I'd love to share in just one moment of, of silent uh, worship together to close out the night. And thank you again, Benigno, and thank you all for, for joining us here on Zoom.